All right. And just a heads up for everybody, this will be streamed on YouTube Live as well. Your comments won't be seen on YouTube Live, um, but this, this webinar will be streamed there and, and we'll be talking about your comments as they come in. Let me go ahead and pull up our PowerPoint slide. And I see we have some familiar faces in here. Now, everybody, I will repeat this just a few times. Um, when you are introducing yourself or just when you're talking in the chat box in general, if you could make out your messages to all panelists and attendees, um, we'll say this 100 times throughout today's webinar, but uh, just the default is to go to all panelists. We want to make sure everybody's seeing your chat messages. Um, so again, if you address your chat messages to all panelists and attendees um, so everybody could see it. And at some point, we'll start calling you out. We'll say, hey, that's a great comment, so-and-so, but you need to, will you say it to everybody? Oh, thank you, Jane. Yes. <laughs> see Karen Benson from Gravit Public Library. Nice to see you, Karen. Bonnie, it's good to see a familiar name. Ah, yes. Thank you, Claire. Let me try sharing in a different way. Oops. All right, and everybody, we'll get started in just one minute. <laughs> Gail, it's always good to see a fellow um, Alabama person in here. All right, everybody. Well, it is one o'clock and we have a jam packed agenda today. So I want to go ahead and get started. Um, I know many of you have probably been to a StarNet webinar uh, before, but uh, today's really exciting because we're talking about some subject matter that's kind of close to our hearts and near and dear to our hearts. Um, so I'll be screen sharing throughout the day. I'll be driving. Um, we have Kelly and Claire joining us as well, some familiar faces. Um, so yeah, uh, this is the team for today and, and we're just excited to get started. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and jump right in. Um, if you haven't already, please introduce yourself in the chat. Uh, you won't have microphone access today. We're going to be doing most of our interaction in the chat box and through some third party like online kind of interactive engagement things that I think will be pretty fun for everybody. If you are looking for today's link bank, you can find that on our blog website. So that's just starnetlibraries.org slash blog. And Claire, I reckon now would be a good time if you wanted to drop that link bank uh, URL in the chat box so people could just go ahead and access that. Um, so this link bank will have all of the resources that we're talking about today so you don't have to frantically write down URLs or screenshot or anything like that. After this webinar is um, complete in about 24 hours or so we'll have the recording along with the, the PowerPoint slides and the chat box um, uh, information as well. Um, we are oops, we are screen sharing this or um, excuse me we are recording this webinar um, so just giving you that that heads up right there. All right. You know, I've done it, done a hundred Zoom meetings, but somehow it still gets confusing trying to screen share. So, uh, just wanted to give you all a quick heads up that you know our, our work is uh, funded by NASA, um, some of the wonderful folks at NASA and the Science Mission Directorate, um, and our NASA at My Library project specifically. Um, so, we have a long, you know, we're part of the Space uh, National Center for Interactive Learning at the Space Science Institute. Um, uh, and the Star Library Network is kind of, you know, how we, we bring library staff together. And then our NASA at My Library project is just one of those awesome projects where we get to share exciting STEM and STEAM resources uh, uh, with you all from our friends at NASA. Um, so I, Kellyanne and Claire, if you just want to, you know, say hello uh, really quickly, that would be awesome. And I don't hey, have my... <laughs> oh. Sorry. Uh... Totally, 
jumping the gun here, but uh, just to introduce myself, I'm Claire Ratcliffe. I am one of the education coordinators at the Space Science Institute um, and work on the professional development team here with Brooks and Kellyanne. Hey everyone, I was just chatting with so many familiar faces that I'm, I haven't gotten to see in a while. I'm Kellyanne LeConte, I'm the Professional Development Manager at the, uh, with Starnet here at the Space Science Institute, and uh, basically a lifelong learner and um, always attempting to be a, do my best to be a guide on the side. So looking forward to sharing what we've learned so far with you all. Wonderful, thank you Kellyanne and Claire, we're looking forward to hearing from you. And I know you all have probably, if you've been to a webinar with us before, you know about all of our wonderful StarNet resources. But of course, always want to point out the STEM Activity Clearinghouse. A lot of different great collections of, of different activities that we've kind of curated there. Um, I believe we're close to five, we're at 499 activities on the STEM Activity Clearinghouse right now. Um, and these are library specific or, or library appropriate activities. They're not something you would you know, do in a school or classroom setting or even, you know, museum setting. It, it's, they're, they're designed with library staff in mind. So if you do have a chance to do um, some of these activities on the STEM Activity Clearinghouse, please, please, please leave a review because that really helps, well, it helps us, but it helps all the other library staff that are accessing that website as well. We'll talk a little bit about our STEAM Ahead at Home website. You've probably seen this as well. Uh, hopefully you've used it, you know, uh, throughout this summer. But we have some virtual program ideas and resources if you're looking to do virtual programs. Um, things you could share directly with families at home. So um, things that don't require a facilitator. And we have like a professional development section. So if you have time on your hands, which seems like none of us have time on our hands, but uh, and you want to go back and do some training, we have um, an area for that as well. Um, and I wanted to talk about the guide on the side web page. Actually, um, Claire, as you because you designed it, do you want to say any words about the guide on the side web page? Yeah, so um, Brooks and Kelly and I have been really exploring this guide on the side of facilitation technique for quite a long time. And so um, that's, that's what we're talking about today um, in celebration of an article that we just also published. And Brooks will talk about that in a minute. Uh, but through all of that exploring and writing and um, investigating, uh, we have created a website um, on our Starnet webpage. Um, for you guys to check out. So this is just one example of one of the tools that we have on the web page, but um, this is a little key that can help you identify what your facilitation style is. Um, and there's a lot of information on this web page about uh, strategies, uh, sample questions, um, there's photos, there's a video. If you know, if reading uh, can take up a lot of time and you just wanna watch a short video on what Guide on the Site is, there's all of these resources and more. Um, so definitely check it out. It's at www.starnetlibraries.org slash resources slash guide on the side. Tons of great resources on this webpage. Awesome, thank you, Claire. And so I'm not gonna say the whole reason we're here because I'm sure we would have done a webinar um, regardless of whether we had published this article or not, but um, we're really, really excited to be um, in the Association for Library Service to Children's Children and Libraries Journal. Um, this is volume 18, uh, their, their, their fall issue that just came out. Um, we did an article called STEAM Learning in Public Libraries, a Guide on the Side Approach for Inclusive Learning. And today's kind of just talking about some of those resources and strategies that we discuss in that paper. If you're more of a word or like written learner and you want to check that out, um, uh, the URL is right there on the screen. I did the full URL and then a bit.ly to make it a little bit easier. Um, and I wanted to actually show you quickly how to access that. Um, stop screen sharing. So if you go to the ALSC uh, main webpage and you go to their Children's and Libraries ALSC journal, um, just because it took me a little bit of time to figure out how to access this, if you can't access the digital version for free. I would encourage you all to get a subscription um, to the Children and Libraries Journal as well, and you can get the imprint issues. But if you click on back issues, get a few back issues, and you click on this one, fall 2020, um, you can go down. I would encourage you, it's a lot of great stuff. A good article from Sharon about things she misses during the pandemic, but we are right here, the STEAM Learning in Public Libraries, and you can click on HTML or PDF. So really easy to access. I believe it's in our link bank too, so definitely encourage you to check that out. Get back to our slides. All right, so I want to jump in um, and do a fun thing with you all, kind of as an icebreaker today. Um, so instead of our standard like, oh, just say in the chat or 
um, you know, do a poll question through Zoom, we're using something called idea boards. Um, so here's this link on the screen and I'm gonna get out of our presenter view. Um, so I would encourage you all, let me just drop this in the chat for you. I'm gonna stop sharing. So if you go to this link, let's do a www for you. It'll take you to this website. And it has a question there, very simple question. What is the best part of fall? So what you can do, if you can say, you can click on that plus sign and you can just say pumpkins, right? And so I put pumpkins up there. Now you can go and you can write your own. You can say, oh, I like uh, cozy fires. And you can click right here to do plus one and you can change or you can upvote my answer. So it's just kind of a fun interactive tool you can use to engage with your audience. So I'll put the link in the chat. Let's see if it's... I just put an alternative link into the chat as oh, well. Oh, thank you, wonderful. I'm getting, uh, for some reason, my view's a little weird. So let me, like I'm not able to see you and Kelly and when I screen share. There we go, okay. All right, so somebody put sweater weather in here, lower humidity, cooler temps and the colors. All right, now that I can see Kelly and Claire, I can see your video, it makes me feel a lot more comfortable to know that I'm not just speaking to it. Oh, fall foliage hikes, yeah. The end of 100 degree days, I bet somebody from Arizona wrote that. Oh my. Let's see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna upvote this apple cider, definitely. I have a big jug in my fridge right now. And we'll give you guys about, I don't know, 10 or 15 more seconds. Somebody said nothing. Where did my summer go? I feel that. Crunchy leaves. Leaves changing colors, which doesn't happen in Florida. You were right about that. Okay, five more seconds. I think uh, the most upvoted answer here is Halloween and horror movies. Hiking and leaf peeping. Awesome. Okay, so I have a second idea boards. Uh, that's like our fun icebreaker one. This is our more serious. We're on a webinar. We're going to talk about professional development. Uh, the second question one is, uh, what are the what steam connections off the stuff we just talked about out of fall in general? What steam connections could you make um, to fall weather? So let me give you the new link for that one. All right. So check the idea boards link I just dropped in the chat. And what steam connections for the fall? I have one that I would love to see a library do. Launch a pumpkin. So I know a lot of y'all think that we are the experts for steam programming and steam library programming, but really you all are the experts and we like to draw our, um, our information from you. So this is just really our chance to kind of crowdsource some good ideas. Nope. Oh, I just put the link to all the panelists. Sorry, let me do it to everybody. There you go. Oh, man, that's such a good answer. Okay, photosynthesis activities to explore the changing color of leaves. That is like a, that's a STEM superstar answer right there. Pumpkin slime, oh my gosh. I see a lot, I gotta upvote this pumpkin drop one. Pumpkin volcano, so doing a volcano like explosion, bacon soda and vinegar within a pumpkin, that sounds pretty fun. Um, see, density comparison with fall fruits and vegetables, that's, a really cool idea. Fall gardening pool, learning about leaves, dry ice and slime. I don't know if that's fall specific, but that's always kind of fun to do, I think. Ghoulish slime, I love it. Mr. Pumpkinhead contest. Using leaves in a sensory bin. Oh, that's a really cool idea. Putting leaves in a, like a, when you're saying sensory bin, I'm assuming kind of like going in there and being able to feel and touch and kind of not knowing what the object is. All right, y'all, for the sake of time, I wanna make sure we have uh, plenty of time to do all of our stuff today. These are great answers though. What I can do is export these answers 
And then when we kind of do our um, post webinar resources, I could include these answers so we can politely steal from each other. Very cool, great answers y'all. We're gonna be using idea boards potentially one more time um, today. Just depends on how the time and the flow goes. So just you know, be prepared to, to do this one more time. All right. So let me get back to our slides. And I want you to, this is not um, uh, a response. I want you to think about this question and to continue thinking about this question uh, for today's presentation. What is a STEAM learning experience in your life that stands out to you or had a big impact? So what is a STEAM learning experience that you remember? It could have been recently, it could have been many, many years ago um, that just that had a really big impact. I said, you can share this in the chat just because it's great to hear these questions, um, but this is really for you to reflect and to think about. One STEAM experience, uh, learning experience that's had a big impact. Um, what about it had an impact? Why do you think it stood out to you? Um, and we're going to revisit this question. We're going to talk about some STEAM learning pathways. And we're going to revisit this question at the end of uh, today's session. So just a really, really quick agenda overview, intro icebreaker. We've already done that. We're going to be talking about STEAM learning pathways, a few specific moves and strategies you can use. We're gonna do a hands-on activity and end with a discussion with whatever time left we have. And I just wanna say really quickly before we jump in, um, we're gonna begin with this kind of like guide on the side philosophies. We're gonna come from our perspective. And then at the end, uh, we're gonna make time for a discussion because we really wanna hear on your experiences. We wanna hear what you think um, and, and how you use these strategies in the past or how you might use these strategies. So um, we have some ideas, but we would ultimately you know, put the ball in your court. All right, so I'm gonna turn things over now to Claire to talk a little bit, kind of kick us off on, on facilitation styles. Yeah, thanks, Brooks. Um, so we're gonna talk about three different facilitation styles um, that you may or may not be familiar with um, and talk about how some of these strategies may not be the most ideal for a library learning setting um, and uh, talk about a strategy that we love and hope that you can uh, take into your practice while you do learning programs at your library. Next slide, please. So first, I just want you guys to take a look at this illustration. Um, who is there? Who is involved? Who is not engaged? I'm um, going to just type out some of your observations in the chat. So what do you notice in this illustration? Give you about five seconds or so to think about your answers. But yeah, really think about who is participating, who is not participating, um, who is engaged, who does not look engaged. So we're seeing uh, someone is checking his watch on the phone. Uh, the parents are more involved than the kids, but someone else notices that some of the adults are checked out as well. Many look uncomfortable. Um, some of the kids are not paying attention. One is on the phone, one is playing. Um, some of the adults are listening. I'm, I'm glad that uh, you guys noticed that. So this is, uh, it's kind of a mixed bag here. So there are a couple people maybe in the front row who look engaged, um, but there are definitely some even adults looking at their watch, a kid playing with a car, you know, totally checked out. Um, Charlene says only two people are really engaged. Awesome. <laughs> Nikki says adults can kill a kid's program when they're distracted and have side discussions. Absolutely. Um, that's a good, really good point. Um, yeah, great observations. Um, Brooks, could you advance the slide, please? So this is a, what we call a sage on the stage approach uh, to facilitating. Um, other terms that you might be familiar with are called direct instruction or um, talking as teaching. Um, but you guys were, you really hit the hammer, uh, right? Hit the nail with the hammer, whatever that phrase is. But yeah, your, um, your comments in the chat were right on. So basically um, the focus is on the instructor, not necessarily the learners. Um, this instructor is basically delivering a lecture so there's not a lot of interactiveness and the audience is really just there as passive listeners. They're not actively engaged. 
Um, and this form, the stage on the stage approach, uh, works under the assumption that people can learn just by listening. Um, and a lot of research has come out about our brains, about how they work, about how people learn, um, and really showing that that's not the best way for most people to learn. Um, there are all kinds of different learning styles that people just innately have. And some people are auditory learners. They, they can listen to a lecture, they can absorb that information, but a lot of people don't fall under that category. Maybe they're more, they need a visual stimulation or something kinesthetic where they're up and moving their bodies around. Um, so this is a, a strategy that is still common today. You might see this often in schools or maybe when you were growing up in school, you can remember sitting at a desk, listening to a lecture. Um, not the best way to get information and engagement, especially in a library setting where you have people coming and going. Um, they might not be there for that whole time. So if they miss something at the beginning, um, that's really important. They're going to be totally lost later on. So um, just something to be aware of as you are developing your facilitation styles in your library. Next slide, please. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a taste of this. Um, so I would like to now give you guys a bit of information about the Earth and the moon through a lecture. So the current scientific hypothesis um, holds that our moon was created by a giant collision between an object in space and the Earth. When they collided, the smaller object shattered and its remains were blown, blown into space or incorporated back into the Earth. Over a short time, uh, geologically speaking, that's about 100 years or less, um, the leftover debris clumped together and formed our moon. Over time, the moon went through, went through many transformations as iron layers sank and formed its cores and asteroids and comets pummeled its surface um, and pockets of hot mantle material flowed through the surface cracks and cooled as dark volcanic rock. Uh, for the last billion years, our moon has been geologically inactive and then humans entered the scene. Apollo astronauts explored the moon to analyze the rocks and to understand the origin of the moon's features, but it's quite a journey to get to the moon from the Earth. So it took the astronauts two and a half days just to uh, travel to the moon in the fastest rocket that we had at that time. Um, and that's because the moon is 238,900 miles away. The moon is 1,094.4 miles in radius, while the Earth is 3,905. Uh, 58.9 miles in radius. And thank you for listening. I will now turn it over to Brooks to showcase another facilitation style. Wow, well, thank you, Claire. Quite uh, engaging. No, not really, but uh, thanks for that um, information. I'll see how, how much it sticks for me personally, but I want to talk to you all about a different kind of style of facilitation now. This is kind of our second. And uh, we're going to start by um, just take a look at this picture. Same thing that like Clara said. What do you, what do you see? What do you notice in this picture? And specifically, who gets to participate with this, and who doesn't get to participate? So, took about thirty or forty-five seconds for chat um, box interactions. So again, just kind of, what are you seeing? And then who gets to participate and who isn't participating? And um, just a reminder in the chat box, please address it out to all panelists and attendees. So Gail saying all people that are verbal, so people that like to speak are getting to participate. Um, Charlene, nice, nice last name Charlene says, lots of engagement, hand raised, eye contact. So I, I see, in, I see some, I see about half of the folks may be engaged. Um, the instructor has open arms and objects that kids can interact with. Okay. And those who volunteer get to participate. So there's some engagement with the Q&A, but maybe not hands-on learning. Most kids are engaged only, I love this. Most kids are engaged, right? But only two will be able to participate. Ah, Annie, yes. It also encourages competition this kind of learning style. Very, very important. And maybe some people like competition, but a lot of people that can make them shut down, right? All right, so let me move on to our next slide. And this is what we would call uh, the, you know, more official name would be initiation response evaluation, but we've kind of given it the nickname of trivia master, okay? 
So if anybody's done trivia before and you go and it's very much you either got the question right or the question wrong, the trivia master doesn't, you know, reward you for getting close or, or having a good answer, even though it wasn't it. It's a very much a right or wrong situation here. So in this situation, the facilitator, right? So uh, our, our, our woman with the globe in the, the model here, they ask closed ended questions. So questions can be really, really good, but when they're closed ended, yes or no, right or wrong answers, uh, that doesn't necessarily stimulate learning. That's more of a regurgitating facts and information. Um, the facilitator in this situation controls the discussion as well. They have the power to shut down the discussion. They have the power to, um, or and essentially they're doing, they're the ones doing most of the talking um, and they really, really are in control of the flow and the dynamics of the conversation and the discussion. Um, oh yes, they, they do the majority of the talking. Um, so again, this is a chance um, uh, for the, for the, trivia master sometimes to share what they know um, and, and they are doing most of the, the talking. It's not super, it's a two-way avenue of communication. And then we think about the patrons in this situation. The patron's job is to recall, list, recite, or label. Um, again, we're not really expanding on ideas. We're not conceptualizing. And the patrons are rewarded for correct answers. Okay. Um, so again, that's not, um, there's a right or a wrong. There's no, um, uh, Congratulations for, for having a, a good mindset as you're approaching a question or, or for thinking of things in a different way. It's very much yes, no, black or white. So that again is trivia master, initiation, response, and evaluation. And that name, you know, you're initiating a question, the person's responding, and you're evaluating their response. So I want to give you a, a little brief taste of this. Um, so we have on this screen, well, let me ask you, what is that an image of on the left? Who can tell me what that we have an image of on the left? Okay, let's see, Earth. Okay, yes, that is correct. Now, what about on the right? What do we have an image of on the right? The moon, okay, great. Now, who can tell me how wide, um, what is the diameter of the Earth? How many miles wide is the Earth? A lot, Four, Google? Come on, y'all, I need specific answers here. How wide is the, how wide is the earth? Yes, does anybody remember from Claire's lecture? She, she just presented this information. 4,900 something, the earth, y'all, is 7,921 miles wide, while the moon is 2,159 miles wide. Um, okay, how, let's see, how many, how many humans have ever touched the moon before? How many humans have ever touched the moon? Six, no, six, no, three, no, 12. Yes, Dolores, you got it right, 12. Okay, Charlene, yes. Um, okay, you know what? I think, I think I've proven my point here. And that is that it is not that helpful. You all are answering questions, we're interacting, um, but this is very much a right or wrong situation. And I obviously am not being serious about, you know, being agitated, so. Um, this is, yeah, sorry, this is the trivia master approach. And again, right or wrong, I'm controlling the discussion. Um, and like, I wouldn't comment on Stephanie's wonderful comment that it takes over a thousand of them to drive across the country or to drive across the globe. So uh, anyway, I, I, there's not much interaction there. There's not much engagement going on. I am now going to turn things over to Kellyanne and I'm gonna get back on the slide for you, Kellyanne, sorry. That sounds great. Thanks, Brooks. Yeah. You can I tell thought I might be being too too mean there as a joke so <laughs> we're having a little bit of fun with 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 this i hope you're all you're catching catching that we're trying to add a little humor here but seriously though we do see that uh stem has perhaps a little bit unfairly really been associated with those two styles that sort of sage on the stage and trivia master where the facts are really the important piece and that it's very black and white and we wanted to really highlight today how we could have an alternative vision and we're thinking about here that STEAM learning really centers on exploration, inquiry, and creativity, and much more like the real professions that uh, we're, we're trying to highlight with a lot of our work. It's much more open-ended and less, much less black and white than it's often get um, portrayed. So we wanted to talk through how this could go, we could go forward and use our ability to run programs for all ages and think about what can we do 
that mixes this up a little bit? How can we change this trend and make it more genuinely STEAM focused? Next slide, please, Brooks. So once again, I'd love for you to take a look at this, this image and just put pop there, there in the chat. What do you notice? Who's participating? And what's the role of the facilitator? What do you see here? So I see in comment, both are, both are participating. Ex there's excitement in engagement. You're seeing that in the body language, right? You're looking at them, seeing how they're both very much involved, experiential. It looks like they're having fun, which is always a great, great goal. And I see here uh, this idea, guide on the side leader, facilitator observes and is available if needed. Uh, collaboration is good, great point. And Nikki, I love how you're going into the detail here. Working together to complete a task, the facilitator is observing, and this is just a snapshot on time, but we're, we're looking maybe, perhaps this facilitator is ready to step in and make suggestions or ask questions to prod the children further. Great point. All right, let's 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 go ahead and move on. Keep the comments coming if you, if you have anything else to add here. Brooks, next slide, please. So in our terminology here, we're adopting the label for this style, a guide on the side approach, really to contrast against that sage on the stage model that we might have experienced in some, some of our schooling or some other experiences and really highlight what we're looking as we're doing STEAM uh, learning uh, opportunities for communities, we're really thinking more of this type of role for the facilitator. And we wanted to dig into this a little bit because it is, of course, like all of these things, does take a little bit of effort and thought on the part of the facilitator. So we wanted to spend some time today giving you some tips on how do you go about being a, a guide on the side in your programs. Next slide, please. And to give this it's a little bit of context, I wanted to give you a sense of circuits activities. Now there's a ton of them out there. I'd love it if, you're, if you've are if you done a circuits activity, please go in and, and do a little chat about what your experience has been. If you've tried it, likely you've had, had at some point needed to step in and help uh, the that your community members work through to get their circuit to work. It's a little bit tricky and doesn't go completely smoothly. It may not be completely intuitive. People may not have ever done it before on their own. So there might be a lot of places for you to step in. So how in the world can you go about doing that? Now, as we go through this, I do also wanna to show in the next slide here how this this it take, does take effort, but it's worth so much with the, the investment you get from your your learners in your program. You could go to the next slide, please, Brooks. And uh, seeing firsthand how this really draws the adults in as well, not only the children, but when you get that creativity going and that a little bit of technology, it's something magic about that that really brings in all ages to want to come play. Next slide, please, Brooks. So here, as you're thinking about how do you go about doing this? And you're trying to be that guy on the side, like this um, wonderful engineer here who is helping in a library program. She was stepping in and she had to phrase her questions very carefully. Now, as you're trying to do this, we've got a great resource we're gonna direct you to, which is the Click to Science uh, portfolio of um, how-to videos. And we've got a sample one for you. We're gonna pull up and just play a clip out of that. If you could please, Brooks. What do you need to turn around? Maybe. Oh. And what could you do? With Maybe you put them on the opposite ah. side. Ah, try it. We got it. Okay. What did you do? When doing STEM, it's important to ask purposeful questions. But what about when youth are struggling? How do we keep from just giving them the answer while still trying to keep them engaged? Watch as the frontline staff in this maker tinker space use question scaffolding. Using prompts that begin with I wonder or I notice before each question, the frontline staff builds on what youth have done and then helps them develop the next step through questions. Frontline staff.
staff are guiding youth to think more deeply about the STEM activity. So one thing, I notice that your copper tape is here and here. What can you do to the legs of your LED to make it touch the copper tape here and here? So that's step one of your troubleshooting. The LED was actually working. What else might be the problem? I turned it around. You turned it around. We checked the, we checked the polarity, and that seems to be working. What's the other component that we have under here? The battery. The battery. Well, do you check this battery? Do we know if this battery is actually working? Okay, so the battery is working, right? So let's put the battery back on here. So then what's the last thing? I heard some friends earlier saying that they had to do something with the rails. What did they have to do with the rails? Yeah, they had to press them really, really tight and make it smooth, right? So that's the last part of our troubleshooting here. The only thing is we need to make a gap right here. So what could we do? All right? What could we do to make a gap right there? Use the scissors. Yeah, so take this up. So, yeah. I just realized I have another problem. I don't know how to figure out how to, like, I'm trying to give us all, like, a little nose, like an LED nose. Okay. So that, that glows. Um, but... The placement of your LEDs. All right, so, so what can we do? How can we address this problem? You really want that nose in there, right? Like, for all of us or something. Okay, well, let's try one first. Go in. And I realize that if I'm holding it close... Oh, I got a hole. Yeah. You realize that if you got it, if you hold it closer to the paper, it doesn't bend? Okay. So now we're going to flip this over. All right. And now you're going to have to move some of your copper tape. All right. So I hope you guys... Uh, heard some of those really great questions, those probing questions that the facilitator was giving to those kids before just telling them what the answer was. Remember, we're trying to steer away from teaching as talking um, and help our participants um, try to derive and understand the knowledge for themselves. Um, so we are going to go into now six different strategies that can help you hone those guide on the side uh, facilitation styles uh, for your STEM programs at your library. So strategy one is create a safe learning environment. Um, this means you're creating an area uh, where it's okay to fail your first time. Uh, you know, with the, the guy, with the sage on the stage or the trivia master, there is some weight that the participants are carrying that if they're not correct, that could be embarrassing, that could be scary. Um, so if you just ask them a question with one correct answer, those more introverted participants might not even give it a shot. Um, so you're creating a place where you're tinkering. You don't have the answers. Maybe even you don't know the answers and you're all exploring together. And just remind your patrons that being wrong is the first step in finding the right answer. So that should be celebrated, you know, um, just encourage them, encourage their participation and celebrate that they're even trying. Um, so yeah, create an, an environment where failing is okay. Next slide, please. So you can do this by just some really simple phrases in your back pocket. So if someone asks you a question, you can say, I don't know. Let's find out together. Or that's an interesting thought. How did you come up with it? So again, maybe they have, maybe they're not on the right track. Maybe they had, uh, they're getting there though. And they're asking questions. Um, so probe a little deeper instead of just telling them, no, that's wrong. This is how we do it. See how they came to that thought process and see if you can help them, help to guide them through uh, to get to the correct answer. Next slide, please. Strategy number two is using open-ended questions. So an open-ended question is something that has multiple right answers. So uh, Brooks demonstrated some closed questions when he asked, uh, what is the object you see on the left? What is the object you see on the right? Those clearly have just one correct answer. Um, but when you are wanting more engagement so that uh, so that you can welcome patrons into 
uh, into the exploration, maybe they maybe it's a four year old in your program and a 12 year old in your program. Obviously, they're going to have different background knowledges, but you can get them both engaged by asking open ended questions such as uh, what does this remind you of? Um, what is something that you can remember about the moon? So having it just multiple answers can invite more people to participate. Next slide, please. So here are a couple more examples of some open-ended questions. So what do you notice? And can you tell me more? Next slide. So strategy three, I'm going to approach this a little differently. So I'm going to show you a series of four illustrations. And I want you to take about five seconds or so just to observe these illustrations and the progression and tell me what you notice at the end. So uh, Brooks, if you could slowly go through these next four images. And next. So we'll do that one more time. Those are the progression of images. All right. So Brooks, if you could go to the slide after the progression. Um, you guys saw that a few times, just going through about five seconds of different images. So what did you observe in that progression? Uh, Michelle says each of them had a moon, making them wanting to think and want to participate. And yeah, uh, Sheree's children take different amounts of time to get the answer. Having a tactile learner get a chance to participate by holding on to those models. Um, and at the end, they all seem to be participating and enjoyed it. Right. Excellent. So Brooks, next slide, please. So this is called wait time. So this strategy uh, asks you to wait approximately five seconds after asking a question. Try responding to someone who took longer to form his or her thoughts. Um, because this gives time for learners to think about and articulate their ideas. Um, if you guys have ever facilitated a STEM program, I'm sure you know this experience, especially with younger kids. But if you ask a question, hands just immediately go up before they even have a, have a chance to really think about what their answers are. Um, I can't tell you how many times when I've been teaching about, yeah, first graders, I'll ask a question. They're all so excited to answer. I'll call on someone and the kid says, oh, wait, I don't know. They just wanted to answer. They just wanted to raise their hand. Um, and those are those extroverted students who just, they can't help it. They are engaged, they want, they want to participate. Um, but then we have those deeper, those deep thinkers, those introverts, those, those kids in the back um, that they can come up with the answer if you give them that time, if you give them the opportunity to think through what they want to say, give them that opportunity to build up their courage to talk in front of a group. And then you, you'll notice that they, they raise their hand and you have more kids to, to call upon, more um, opportunities for those students or patrons to participate. Next slide, please. So this five second wait time can definitely feel a little awkward at first, um, uh, especially right now when we're on Zoom and everything is virtual and you ask a question and it's just silent for a minute, um, you can, kind of have that urge to maybe fill the silence. Um, I know I do that all the time. I, the five second wait time is something that I struggle with um, just because it can feel a little awkward. Um, but this is really, really important, um, again, for helping those shy students, those introverted patrons, um, just to give them an opportunity to form their thoughts and really think it through. Um, so that's our, our five second wait time strategy. Next slide. Um, our next strategy, we call this turn and talk. So while waiting five seconds to give more patrons the opportunity to think about what their answer is and have the um, courage to participate, 
the turn and talk method really gets everybody talking. You're not just calling on one person. Um, you're giving a chance for everyone to share their ideas. So basically you would ask a question and instead of saying, who can tell me what this is, you would first phrase your question. So maybe this question could be, um, how big do you think, uh, the, if the earth were a basketball, how big do you think the moon would be? Turn and talk with your neighbor about this. So you're not even giving them the opportunity to just raise their hand so you can call on them. You're giving everybody an opportunity to talk about their thoughts just with their neighbor. This could be with the caregiver that brought them there, a sibling, a friend. Um, and it, it, it gives everyone an opportunity to, to talk and get out their, their um, ideas before just calling on somebody. Next slide, please. Um, so again, here's another example. So please turn and tell your family member or friend your ideas. It gives them a chance to, to sort through their ideas without being put on uh, display in front of everybody. So again, it works for those shy kids, it works for those extroverts, and it gets everyone sharing their thoughts and ideas. Next slide. Here's another way to phrase it. Help each other figure it out. Take your time. I will come back in a few minutes to see how you're doing. Again, it's taking all of the um, focus off of the instructor as the keeper of knowledge and giving it back to the learners um, to explore their own ideas and come up with the answers on their own. Next slide. Strategy number five, this is one uh, that we really believe in strongly here at the Space Science Institute, but it's getting hands-on or nowadays, since we can't really be in person, we call it interactive learning. So something for the patrons to be actively looking at, um, holding in their hands, testing. Um, it gives them another active engagement piece instead of just sitting there listening. Next slide, please. If you are looking for hands-on or interactive activities, uh, this is yet another plug uh, for our STEM activity clearinghouse that Brooks mentioned earlier, but we have almost 500 activities that are all geared for this type of learning and you can access them at clearinghouse starnetlibraries.org. And our last strategy we want to share with you today is finding common or shared experiences that the patrons can bond together with. Um, a great way to do this is by using activities that include some sort of storytelling um, that really makes patrons think back on their own lived experiences. One activity that we um, that is on our uh, resource list that we've been dropping in the chat is called Who Dirtied the Water? Um, this is an activity where the facilitator is reading a narration, but there are strategic places throughout the story where you're asking the participants questions that they have to think back on their own life. Um, and this, the whole story revolves around water. And water is something everybody can relate to. Uh, we cannot live without water. We cannot uh, wash our clothes or our bodies or eat or anything without water. So this um, this story or this activity really draws on that shared experience of, of humans need for clean water. So I highly recommend checking out Who Dirtied the Water if you're looking for um, a fun story time activity that draws on the shared experiences of your patrons. Now I'll hand it back over to Brooke. Wonderful, thank you, Claire. And I'm just gonna remove my background real quick so that I can do this next activity. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about, okay, we've talked about you know ways to engage and ways to do fun activities, um, but I wanna actually show you one. And this is cool to me because this activity is kind of based in numbers, it's based in distances and sizes, but you can totally do guide on the side and you don't have to be a subject matter expert um, to facilitate this. I, you know, I was doing the trivia master stuff. I personally I have a background of like in geology. I'm not a space science expert per se, um, but I, you know, and, and you don't have to be a space science expert either to facilitate space science or STEM activities. Um, so anyway, I want to go ahead and get started with this. It's called Earth's Bright Neighbor, and it deals with this idea of size and scale. Okay, so it can be really, really hard to conceptualize just how big space is uh, and how things are separated out in outer space in terms of uh, our solar system, you know, like we see those models of our solar system with the plane that's all crammed right up next to each other, and it's pretty inaccurate. Um, so this activity and a lot of other scale activities like this just help learners 
kind of conceptualize actually the distance and the size of, of objects in our solar system. So for this, and, and I put this in the materials list um, leading up to this web, webinar. So if you didn't get it, that's completely fine. You can still participate. But if you did happen to get that blueberry and a peppercorn um, or, a, or a grape, so you can either use a large blueberry, a small grape, and a peppercorn for this activity. I have two right here, grape, peppercorn, uh, those are the only materials you really need. And I like this because you could facilitate this really casually and fun in an informal virtual setting. All right, so we have our grape or a blueberry on, well, you're probably seeing it inverted. Uh, on our left, we have our peppercorn on the right. Um, and our whole, okay, so our grape represents the, our planet Earth, right? You can probably see that here. And our peppercorn represents our moon, okay? So think about the size, look at your grape, look at your peppercorn, think about the size difference, okay? And, and like I said earlier, our earth is about four times as wide as the moon. Uh, the moon roughly is about 2000 meters wide. And when I say wide, I mean diameter, not circumference. 2000 uh, miles, excuse me, uh, wide, where our earth is about 8,000 miles wide, just really rough approximate numbers there. So our goal with this activity is to figure out just how far apart should this peppercorn in this grape beat? Should they be one inch apart? Should they be two inches apart? Should they be like, I have one in a completely different room, a hundred feet away? Um, so I'm asking you all, like right now, if you have a blueberry and a, and a grape, you know, put them, or a peppercorn and a grape, put them together. Think how many, how many inches, let's say, how many inches apart do y'all think these two should be? If these are accurate representations of the moon and the earth. So you can respond in the chat box if you want, or you can just think about it. So I'm seeing one, that, one just came in that said 12 inches. Sharice says six feet apart, two feet apart, okay. And y'all, if we were doing this as a in-person activity, I would, this would be a great time for the turn and talk strategy. Let's say I was doing this for 30 patrons and I didn't have a chance to actually engage with them on each individual answer. I would say, hey, turn and talk to your neighbor. I want you all to talk about it and talk about why you think that too. Um, so Annie, I would say, why do you think it's three feet? Um, Marie says 15 inches. So we've gotten anywhere from about, gosh, what did I see? Like 10 inches to, to six feet apart. I'll give you about 10 more seconds, 15 more seconds. Again, a grape and a peppercorn. Two feet, 16 inches eight inches. So I want to say that, um, speaking to me not having a, a space science background, when I first came into this job, Kellyanne did a, a similar activity to this with me and asking me to pace them apart. And I got it completely wrong. I was like, way, way, way off. So um, it's absolutely no shame in not knowing the answer. So it's about 15 inches. So Marie, you are exactly right about 15 inches apart. I have my tape measure right here. Let's do 15 inches. Oh, all right, so one end would be the grape, on the other end would be the peppercorn, which just fell off the table, so I'm definitely not going to find that again. So, um, so about 15 inches apart. Now, y'all, that's not, you know, that's just a fun little thing we can do virtually, but you can really expand this activity. And let me just say, too, you don't have to have a grape and a peppercorn. I did not measure these. Um, I have no idea the actual size of each of these. It's not about getting the specific measurement right. It's about just like the, the idea and the, and the concept behind this activity. Um, so we wanna be scientifically, scientifically accurate, of course, but that does not mean that you need to take a small ruler and measure the amount of millimeters that each is. And you can use something besides a grape or a peppercorn. I've actually been lying to you this whole time. This is an unripe cherry tomato that I pulled from my yard this morning because I didn't wanna go get a grape. Um, so you can use beads, you can use small balls, it's just to get an idea of finding something that is roughly four size the time, uh, four times the size of a peppercorn. Sorry for lying. Okay, so next thing I want to do is uh, kind of like keep on moving in this in this realm. And let's say we have our grape, we have our peppercorn, or our unripe cherry tomato. Now I want you to imagine a giant, giant pumpkin. I'm not talking about like just like a table pumpkin. I'm not talking about like just a you know, bigger, like an heirloom, a fancy pumpkin. I'm not even talking about like a jack-o'-lantern pumpkin. I'm talking about like a full, big, county fair, blue ribbon, 55-inch wide pumpkin. So I want you to imagine that, okay? Big, big 55-inch wide pumpkin. Now, what object in the solar system 
would that represent using the same scale? Grape, Capricorn, giant county fair pumpkin. The sun, the sun, two answers for Jupiter. The sun, the sun. Oh, Neptune, okay, all right. So in this situation, this would be the sun. And I love this image. This comes from the Goddard Space Flight Center of NASA. And uh, you can just see how dynamic the sun is. You know, we might think of it as just this thing out in the sky, but you can see there's actually a lot of uh, surface processes going on. And I don't actually know if this is a time lapse or not, but um, so the sun in this situation, peppercorn, uh, or sorry, the moon, earth, big county fair pumpkin uh, would be the sun in this situation. Now let's think about distance, right? And, and actually, I'm sorry, I'm kind of moving through this, but it would be about 500 feet away. So I want you to imagine um, if, you know, just if you have a window, look 500 feet away, and that's where your giant uh, uh, county fair pumpkin would be. And we've actually, if you're thinking right now, like, this is cool, but there's no way we would be able to do this in, in my library with space uh, concerns. Um, we've done this activity or a very similar activity called Jump to Jupiter at a public library. We were doing a workshop in Laramie, Wyoming with an awesome group of librarians. And we set this activity up to where um, I, by the library, we had the objects and then our sun was all the way down the street. So you can get really creative with your space. You can loop back around. If you all had to do it all in a parking lot, you could kind of go back and forth. Or if you had a local football field, you could go um, up and down the, the sidelines to be safe. But I just, I think this activity is really cool because you can do it virtually, you can do it in person uh, and you can adapt it really easily to your location. And so I like this final image, you know, we're thinking about that comparison and just to actually think about, you know, next time you're looking up at the moon uh, to think about those, those perspectives. So that is called Earth's Bright Neighbor. If you do a search on our clearinghouse um, for scale, um, I, I believe this would pop up. Another good fun one is called Jump to Jupiter. Um, similar ideas, um, different implementation on that. So uh, a lot more fun in person because you can actually, you know, have folks talking to each other and you can get them outside and stuff like that. But this could be a really good socially distanced outdoor activity for whenever you return. So let me just do a quick time check. And y'all, we only have five minutes left and I'd really like to get into our discussion. And I saw a couple of really good Q and A's come up. So I want you to, to just maybe think on this question yourself. You don't have to respond. I did put an idea boards link, but I'd rather move into the discussion. Which learning pathway did your STEAM learning experience that we talked about earlier fit into? So I saw some people talk about, you know, uh, somebody said they had a geometry teacher that was really, really engaging and, and set up the classroom in a really cool way. Were they using guide on the side strategies? Were they using uh, trivia master, where they're using Sage on the stage, or, you know, sometimes you can use, people will use a little bit of a combination. Um, so I just want you all to reflect on that and think, you know, that learning experience that really stood out to you, why did it stand out to you? Was it because you were actually engaged in, in interacting with an object or an idea? Um, and, you know, if it was a, a lecture experience, that's totally fine. Some people, we all learn in different ways, and some people learn well from that Sage on the stage. But just when we're thinking about the general population and serving all of our patrons, that guide on the side method, uh, model really does um, cast a wider net of, for learners. So we're going to move on to discussion. We have about five minutes left, as I said. I'm going to check out some of the Q&A questions while we do that. But um, if you could respond in this chat, um, this actually might not be, this kind of on the side stuff might not be a brand new idea for you. This could be very much um, something you're already doing. You've just never put a name to it. Um, so in the chat box, are you what ways are you already doing guide on the side um, strategies in your library programs? And while y'all answer that question, I'm going to check the Q and A's. Ah, yes, that's a great question, Cherise. We'll talk about that. So Megan uh, says um, using. Um, what questions do you have using that kind of questioning versus actually lecturing? Yeah, um, Kelly, and I'm just seeing your messages. I think let's do that um, next. Let me just read through these really quick. Um, Kelly is saying providing lots of hands on experiences, setting up stations with activities and challenges that groups move through. Um, Jolene saying, pre-COVID, uh, we moved our STEAM programs. Just scroll up. Pre-COVID, we moved our STEAM programs to an open house format with stations of different learning levels. Attendance increased and parents got involved. Um, Bonnie says, when we are fully open, I use the guide on the side during our makerspace days. 
currently I have a small homeschool group that I'm incorporating it into. It really gets the kids talking about what they are doing. Very cool, Bonnie. Doug says, in my robotics, robotics classes, I have them explain to me what they think and why things aren't working and let them work through how to fix the issues. Very cool. Kind of a, I, I use guide on the side strategies even outside of work in my, um, my wife and I just moved into a house and she's, my wife has been painting the bathroom and um, she thinks I know the answers to her questions. And she asked me and I say, Hey, let's figure it out together. You know, let's, instead of just Googling it, let's see, let's get our hands on, let's learn something. Very cool. So y'all with the time we have, um, we have two awesome questions in the chat. Sharice asks, how do we do guide on the side virtually? And I think actually I'm going to let um, Kellyanne's maybe been compiling some answers to that. Um, so I was going to let Kellyanne address that question. Absolutely. My pleasure, Brooks. So uh, based on Claire's excellent advice, we're trying to really open this up for your contributions, because certainly we don't know all of the answers as we're all uh, pivoting to COVID, right? So for virtual programs, how do we do this virtually? Um, Dolores put, posted a nice comment. It's difficult on Zoom, but I have my students take pictures and give comments, send them to me, and then I share at the next class. So Dolores, if you have anything else you wanted to add to that, or if anyone had any questions, please jump in the chat. Um, and then we also were trying to share out a little bit about some possible activities and ways to, like, how do you get that social engagement? So there's a little bit of brainstorming and research sharing around things like engineering design challenges, where perhaps family members could go out and grab things from, from the kitchen or, or the supply closet and do those together as a group before they come back to you um, in that online space. Mm -hmm. I do wanna address, um... Stephanie mentioned something about is the student ratio smaller in the guide on the side model versus um, stage on stage on the stage. And, you know, there's very much if you have uh, 500 kids in an auditorium, it's going to be hard to engage with them. But there are certain things you can do, like that turn and talk strategy. You can give them open ended questions. Um, and and you know, I'm talking about in person here. Right. So if you had a huge, huge group, um, you could give them open ended questions to think about. And maybe you can't actually answer them, but you can have them think about those questions. Um, you can have the turn and talk strategies. Um, it's a different type of engagement for sure, but yeah, you could do it with a big, uh, a big group. And I just really love all the, I saw y'all sharing email addresses in the chat box and posting resources. Um, so I'm really looking forward to, to going through the chat box and seeing what everybody else had to say. I had a whole discussion prompt about um, incorporating art into this as well. And I would just say that um, art is a great, great, great way for, for patrons to be able to express themselves and can really serve as that kind of bridge for the rest of the STEAM concepts. Um, so using art as an option for, for patrons to, to learn, to express themselves, to express what they've learned um, can be really helpful. All right, everybody, it's the top of the hour. And I know you all have reference desks and other calls to run off to and virtual programs to run. Um, so thank you all so much. You will be redirected um, to a survey monkey link after this. And at the end of that survey monkey, you can get your certificate of attendance for attending today's webinar. If for some reason you're not able to access it, um, please just send me an email and I'll be happy to send that over to you. So again, we'll get the recording. We'll get resources up in about 24 hours. Great. Uh, the chat box was awesome. You all are awesome. Um, we will see you for our next webinar and I hope everybody has a uh, wonderful rest of the day. All right.